It's one of the most controversial tournaments in history and one that's making history as the first World Cup in the Middle East. It's the last chance for Messi and Ronaldo to win the only major medal they haven't got. There's Kane, Mbappe and Neymar. And if you're watching the opening match on Sunday between Qatar and Ecuador, you'll be one of more than 200 million people around the world drawn together by the irresistible pull of the World Cup. Going behind the scenes of the biggest prize in football, this is World Football in Qatar on the BBC World Service. Hello, I'm Manny Jasmi. Welcome to the programme. Welcome to Doha. Welcome to the World Cup. It's finally here. The Men's World Cup, four and a half years after the last one, starts on Sunday with the opening match between Qatar and Ecuador. And this is world football's most comprehensive coverage of any major tournament. And we've been to a few. We'll have four podcasts dropping every week from here meeting some of the players, the fans and the local people who will be hopefully creating some kind of vibrant atmosphere. So far this week, that hasn't been apparent. So my big thanks to those Tunisian fans who just happen to be wandering past our apartment with their drums. Um, I, I haven't found anyone else um, who's been making that kind of noise so far. But they're all coming, millions of them coming. And uh, the, one of the questions is, how will Qatar cope with them? The usual suspects are here, albeit in lands far, far away. Former USA international Heather O'Reilly, who knows a thing or two about winning World Cups. And former Scotland international Pat Nevin, who's, um, well, we're talking about the World Cup and he's Scottish, so you do the maths. But, Pat, you will be here on Sunday. You've got a ticket for the opening match. What are you looking forward to about that? Well, um, this will be my third opening ceremony I've been to. Um, so I look forward to because it's usually a lot of you know, exciting things happen there. But mostly it's the game. It's the football. Sometimes the problem with the opening ceremony is that you get the wrong people there. You get lots of uh, those, and such as those as we call them in Scotland, i.e. VIPs. And uh, it's not always the greatest atmosphere. However, the game will see to that. So uh, I'm keen to see if everything's uh, ready and working. They've, they've only had 12 years to get it ready, at Manny. So let's see. This. Hope it's all ready. Well, some of it's still being built, Pat, I have, I have to tell you. Um, Heather, you have won the World Cup. What's it like in the days leading up to the first game? Well, I think it's, uh, yeah, there, it's days of optimism. It's days of hope. It's days of positivity because every team whether you're expected to win or maybe a dark horse you think that you could go all the way you think that you could be the heroes of your nation i was lucky enough to get across that finish line in 2015 and, and win gold but uh the lead up is really special i think that this year's version um obviously is a bit truncated the the front end of it the team's aren't together as long as they usually are to prepare. So I'm not sure that like the team camaraderie will be quite the same. Usually you're in the hotel for weeks uh, in preparation uh, uh, in the camp. And, um, you know, you get a lot of downtime playing card games and um, just hanging out with your mates. And this will be a little bit different because it's so short. And also because the teams will see all the other teams around quite a bit. It's such a small country i'm sure that they're almost sharing training fields more or less uh and usually that's not the case you just kind of see the teams on game day so a little bit different this time around but uh, i think right now everybody's hearts are full full of optimism full of positivity and unfortunately that doesn't last too long well it lasts longer for some than others we'll have to see who they are uh heather i've been spending quite a lot of time with the usa uh, squad this week and they've been joined by quite a lot of uh, US Army personnel uh, not uh, not on uh, not in uh, a professional capacity but uh, just uh, meeting them and uh, uh, and seeing them there's a big uh, US military base of course in Qatar did you have anything like that did you uh, did you have visitors from from the military or, or dignitaries like that when you were in World Cups yeah, it's funny that you say that. Um, in 2011, when the World Cup 
um, was in Germany, there was a big U.S. military base in the city that we were staying. And we made sure actually one of our goal celebrations were directed towards them. I think it's nice on, on twofold. Uh, you know, it's nice to recognize your service people and to thank them for what they do. And on the flip side, they can inspire the team. You know, obviously, sometimes as a footballer, you get so in your own world and you know, you talk about pressure and I'm not trying to, to minimalize, you know, minimize the pressure of an athlete. It's real, it's real stuff. But some of these service people have been in life and death situations. And I think that that sort of shared um, national pride can do a good thing for the squad as well. So um, I think that U.S. soccer has always done a nice job in trying to recognize its service people if, um, if there's a base nearby and hopefully it brought some joys to, to them and to the squad as well. Pat, the early teams, uh, the, the teams starting off uh, Monday, Tuesday, teams like England, USA, Netherlands, Senegal, they've only been together for a week. Louis van Gaal, the, uh, the Netherlands coach, made the point that some of his players were still playing on Sunday in their, in their league. How is that going to uh, affect anything? Will, will the players know each other well enough to slip back into the, uh, the new tactics of, of the national team? Or might there be a potential for upsets as the, as the top teams just uh, click into gear? Yeah, I, I think that's a brilliant point. It's one of the most interesting things about the tournament. Now, if we're going to be really harsh about it, I don't think the very best coaches in the world are at this World Cup. It's just a truism because, you know, the, the, a lot of the best ones are at, at club football just now. So, you know, it's up to these managers. Not Some of them are very, very good. And, you know, the, the Dutch have got a, quite a good one there. Or certainly he's got a lot of history. But they have to get the very best out of these individuals. And they will want them to play in different systems. Maybe systems they're not used to. I mean, little things like, here's a thought for you. When you watch the certain football, particularly English football, every single team's playing out from the back. Is that going to be the case for this World Cup? And if so, you're going to be asking some goalkeepers who are not used to it. That could lead to carnage, <laughs> absolute carnage. So things like that. The other thing I'm really keen to when see... When in doubt, kick it out, Pat well, says. And then, well, I'm not saying that. I'm just going to be interesting to see it. I'm, I'm intrigued to see that sort of just small technical things like that, and, and also bigger technical things like... You know, every World Cup changes something. You know, somebody comes up with an idea or you see where the game's kind of going. And this shouldn't be any different. Now, they've not had all that much time to prep for it. You're absolutely right, Manny. And certainly the, the, the managers may think to themselves, can I reinvent the wheel in a couple of days? Well, probably not. But the one thing I'm, I'm keen to see is, are there going to be fearful teams or is it going to be the way football in certain parts of Europe particularly has gone is utterly fearless? You know, teams are attacking everyone else. I hope that's the case at this World Cup, that we've got very, very open football. Because I think it plays into what you mentioned. It's getting harder for a lot of these top players to play every game at high tempo every three or four days and then continue to do it during this World Cup. It's, it's, I think it is a slight advantage to the smaller teams. Knowing how a lot of these teams play, I suspect it might be a World Cup of compact, well-drilled teams playing on the counter-attack. But um, I, mean, I don't know anything, so I'll be intrigued for to see. I'll be intrigued to see. Draws. Yeah. Well, if yeah. you only get you only get here. You know, so many teams don't get here very often. I mean, you're going to go and walk out and simper and not do your best at it. I, mean, I, I just there's a feeling that one or two teams might surprise us and come out and, and believe in themselves a bit more. Well, as I said at the start of the program, Pat's going to be at the opening match between Qatar and Ecuador, as will the Ecuador winger, Jeremy Sarmiento. He spent much of his formative years living in London after his parents moved there from Madrid. And he's been telling me what it means to him to be at the World Cup. It's an amazing feeling, not just for me, but for my family as well. This is um, a moment that we've been waiting for a long time. We've been working hard towards this moment. And uh, for it to finally come, I'm really happy. Um, I can't wait to, to play our first game. Qatar won't be an easy opponent, but uh, with the hard work that we've been putting in these um, past friendlies and uh, in the World Cup qualifiers, I feel like we can have a good game and eventually get the win. What was the moment of qualification like? I remember the game exactly where we had against Paraguay 
unfortunately we had to depend on, on other results to find out that we qualified. But yeah, amazing feeling because it just shows how much, you know, the country was supportive of us, you know, all over everywhere we was getting messages and um in an individual point, you know, all the sacrifices and hard work that I've made, it, it paid off. So uh, I just want to keep going and keep making memories. Tell me about that moment because you lost that game against Paraguay and then you had to wait to see what other teams were doing. What was it like in the dressing room? What was the tension like? Yeah, it was a crazy feeling. I mean, both of the games were going on at the same time, but their game finished first. I was playing, so I wasn't really conscious of what was going on. So it was only till um, the last blow of the whistle is when we, we, we found out uh, where the staff was like, oh, don't worry, guys, everything's going to be OK. You know, you just qualified to the World Cup. You might have lost this game, but, I mean, heads up, you know, we've got bigger things coming. Crazy feeling. Tell me about this young squad. There seems to be a generation that's come up together. You, Moises Caicedo at Brighton, and uh, Pervis Estupinian, your other teammate at Brighton, Pierre Incafier, who's a name that I think a lot of people will uh, become familiar with. Gonzalo Plata, you're all young guys. What are they like? What's the blend like? At a young age, to be playing our first World Cup is an amazing feeling. We will have a great bond together. You know, we laugh on and off the pitch. Uh, we give that fresh energy to the team. And yeah, we're really just excited to start and get kicked off. Who were your Ecuadorian heroes as you were growing up? Who did you want to be when you were playing football in the garden? I think this will be the whole country Ecuador's answer, which is... Antonio Valencia, obviously he's one of the players that I looked up to just because um, we we're similar positions and um, like he, he's a very remarkable player. He's the one that's uh, opened doors for all young Ecuadorian players to express ourselves and with the hard work we can eventually be in Europe and that's what's been happening over the past years. Has he spent much time with the squad? Yeah, I mean there and there he comes to, to watch our games, he eats with us, you know, at, um, the La Casa de Selección that we have over there. So um, it's really good when he comes in and he just gives us a little speech, you know, it motivates us to, to keep being ourselves and just give everything on the pitch. Tell me about your sacrifices that you mentioned earlier, your hard work. I'm a young player, I'm 20 years of age. And um, at that age, you know, any other person would um, be going out, partying and stuff like that. So... Me sacrificing um, those kind of years and those kind of moments is, um, I wouldn't say bad, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's what you got to do uh, as a professional footballer. And then uh, all the hard work that I've been doing, you know, all props to my family as well, who have left everything behind to, to hear, be here with me. And um, I wanted to repay them with uh, something that really meant a lot to them, which was to play for Ecuador. Enjoy the World Cup, Jeremy. It's a great thing to have in your life. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. That's the Ecuador and Brighton winger Jeremy Sarmiento. Pat, you're a pundit who does his homework. You don't just turn up and say, well, you know, difficult game for both teams. <laughs> so what have you learned about Ecuador? Um, well, I've learned a good deal from you. <laughs> you told me about the youth of it. You've been telling me that as we've gone on. So I've looked, you know, obviously we know about the players like Casado and Estepino and then a wee bit of Sarmiento as well. But, you know, the fact that they're a, a younger group... It's very, very difficult to, to know how they're going to be when they turn up for this first game. Which gets me back to why I like the World Cup. Because you don't know. There are so many times we've, we've got used to, certainly in Europe, there's so many competitions, there's so many games, everyone plays against each other, everyone knows all the players. And One of the real joys of it is saying, right, OK, I know all the names, and I've seen a bit of them all, but I've not seen them close, you know, I've not seen them for... A, certainly in the flesh and that makes a massive massive difference so you know I, I think he's right I think he, he makes a very good point that Qatar's going to be hard and a lot of people will write off the Qataris but you know they've got again is it 13 players from Al Saad they might know each other quite well don't you think <laughs> so that always helps a little bit when you've got a good understanding w within the group so you know it, interesting to see what they do and I love the positivity the one thing I will say Manny they're not battering in the goals, are they? Let's be fair. The, the goals aren't hammering in for Ecuador just now, and they need to find a way to get more goals. 
that's that's a very good point, Pat, because at the start of the qualifiers, they were flying in the goals. I remember one game, they beat Colombia 6-1 at home. And that's when you kind of thought, hang on, this is quite a good team. But as the qualification approached, they became more and more cautious. And in the end, just sort of scraped over the line. And uh, they've had a succession of goalless games. So as a, as a young team, how significant is the fact that they don't have experience at this really, really top level and it looks like from the outside that uh, they're becoming more and more stressed out by it. Yeah, and um, it can go both ways. I mean, sometimes with youngsters, it can fly because there is no fear. You know, we're talking about that fear beforehand. And they just put it at the back of mind. And if you're young, you just go in and you do your best. And you don't think about it too much. And don't have people like you, Manny, saying, enjoy this moment. It's such a big thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and putting the pressure and making them understand it is a life-changing moment. Sometimes they go into it and they just are fearless. And that, that's what you want to try and do. But you're right, it seems to be falling away a wee bit just now. But you just never know, you know when it comes to it, especially if they get a good start it can go that positive way. To be honest, the more often, the more common thing is there's a little bit of, well, I was going to say freeze. <laughs> I think metaphorical as opposed to physical freezing for some of the players, but they don't actually do the very, very best because of that, that lack of experience. But it's not a given, Manny. It's absolutely not a given. Sometimes it goes the other way. And uh, also the another thing, just, just to look at a wee bit wider, there are quite a few teams, when you look around, you think, you're actually getting a bit old. You know, some of the teams are, you know, they look maybe past their best. So that youth may well work in their favour. We're sitting by uh, a hotel pool here. Not, uh, we're not in a hotel, so it's not ours. But I'm being <laughs> attacked by winged creatures of the desert. Um, so if I sound a bit distracted, that's why. Heather, what was your approach in your first World Cup? Was it fear or let's just go for it? I think I know the answer. <laughs> No, well, I completely agree with Pat. I think uh, when you're young, and I would use the word oblivious to pressure, to people talking, and, and maybe, you know, that was 2007 for me. So that was, you know, pre very intense social media world. Um, and I think that that helped me. It was over in China. I could turn my cell phone off for like days at a time just enjoy being there. And I was sort of oblivious to the pressures, to the scrutiny, to the fact that like people would be talking about these games for years on to come, decades on to come. I think as a young player, you just are so like wide eyed and just happy to be there and soaking it all in and having fun. Uh, and it frees you up quite a bit. So uh, yes, there are some benefits to experience and uh, being chiseled and hardened, but I, I, I lean way more towards an advantage to a young player kind of taking those shackles off and just going out and playing. And so, yeah, I, I think that, you know, all the managers having to assemble a 26-person squad this time around um, hopefully got their calculations right with, with uh, yeah, seasoned World Cup players and, and the young pups that have nothing to, nothing to fear and not being bogged down by, by stress and, and past, yeah, past failures, I guess you can say. You're listening to World Football on BBC World Service. I'm Manny Jasmi in Doha. Uh, Pat Nevin's also here. And Heather O'Reilly with her terrible voice is uh, stuck in North America. Alongside me here in Doha is the Qatar-based football journalist Ahmed Hashim. Ahmed, welcome to World Football. We've been talking about uh, the sort of lacklustre, underwhelming atmosphere in Qatar so far this week. How would you describe the mood here? Well, definitely it's picking up by the day. And uh, I would say in certain pockets of the city, there is really uh, a genuine sense of excitement for the World Cup from the expatriates here and also from the citizens in Qatar. But definitely not uh, on the same level as you would expect from uh, uh, a normal World Cup. But then again, uh, most of the fans are yet to arrive. They'll probably be arriving in the next couple of days. So within maybe Sunday, by Sunday, I think you would really feel the full sense of it. There were suggestions that the local organising committee hired fan groups uh, belonging to uh, the teams coming here to basically uh, get them singing and cheering 
and being positive. They have vehemently uh, denied that. And there's also been suggestion this week that some f sort of, uh, they're described by some as fake fans, but people have gathered outside the hotels of England, Brazil and France, cheering, but, but not really fans of those countries. Again, uh, denied by the organising committee that that was uh, pre-planned and uh, organised. What's your point of view on all of this? Well, speaking as someone who was there uh, on, on Friday when, when there was a large demonstration of, of fans uh, at the same, almost at uh, the same time from around 2 in the afternoon to around 7 in the evening, there was a huge group of fans of different countries and the big majority of the fans were from India and I'm an Indian myself. And I think a lot of people around the world are unaware of, of a certain element of Indian football fan culture, which is to celebrate the World Cup and to support different teams and not their own team, which has never qualified for the World Cup. So what we saw in most of those videos and pictures of fans celebrating were Indians who have a genuine love for the World Cup and a genuine passion for the teams that they support. For example, Brazil and Argentina are among the most popular teams in India, especially in the southern state of Kerala, where I'm from. And most of the migrants who are here from Kerala, they bring that love from their home state to Qatar and this is probably the closest that they've ever got to a World Cup to experience this, to see the Messi's and the Neymar's. So they're celebrating in the best way possible. So I can say as someone who was there and someone who's from that background that these were definitely genuine fans. I can understand why there is a, 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 an assumption from a lot of Western fans that Qatar hired or, or paid those fans and they're fake fans but I can definitely give you a 100% statement that they're not. It feels like there's a complete breakdown of trust now between the uh, local organisers here and uh, people, particularly in Europe. Is that how you see it? Nobody seems to uh, believe the other side anymore. I think that's an accurate statement, yes. And it's unfortunate that it has reached this point, but it is what it is, and it remains to be seen how things will progress uh, once the World Cup kicks off. Well, the decision to bring the World Cup to Qatar has, to say the least, been a controversial one. There's been heavy criticism of the exploitation, as many would describe it, of migrant workers who, as part of the kafala system, had their passports taken away and were tied to their sponsor, meaning that they couldn't change jobs or leave the country. Kafala has now been scrapped and Qatar has introduced a minimum wage that's higher than many other countries in the region. Others have been concerned about the fact that homosexual acts are illegal here. Others still about the fact that it's illegal for single women to become pregnant. Uh, Ahmed, is it right for a World Cup with so many human rights uh, caveats attached to it to be staged here? I think that's a question for FIFA, to be honest. FIFA decided the, the host and I think FIFA's criteria itself, I think, has changed in the in the last few years it is an interesting debate for sure uh, which countries get to host and which countries are not deserving of that right and uh, we will see especially from 2030 onwards that debate taking an interesting turn and in how many countries are actually considered fit to be host uh, as you said will there be backlash if another country like Qatar bids and maybe even wins the right to host and I think that uh, remains to be seen, but uh, dynamics have changed at FIFA over the last few years, so uh, it's, it's difficult to say. Heather, we've heard on this programme before from the former Finland captain, Tim Sparv, speaking very eloquently about the uh, subject of human rights and, and inclusivity, um, and also encouraging players not to stay silent on, uh, on social issues, big issues like this. But this week, we also heard the French captain, Hugo Lloris say that he won't be wearing the rainbow armband at the World Cup. He believes it is right and uh, normal for foreign people to respect the local culture wherever they are. Um, if, if you played at a tournament where so much attention was on human rights issues, what would you have done? Well, I like to think that I would have been bold about speaking up. The most difficult thing as a player is remembering that the football is important. The football is the, the centerpiece. You need to be 
uh, you know, directing your energies the right way and, and towards your performance. So you don't want to get overwhelmed and bogged down with, yeah, like with stresses of, of taking on too much, of talking a, a, about social issues if you're not comfortable doing so. But at the same time, the whole world is watching. This is a really prime opportunity to make change. So what I would do as a player is be very concentrated and, and, and I guess well-educated on a few things that you want to do to impact. So, you know, is it, is it the migrant workers, visas? Is it LGBT rights? There's, there's just so many issues that you can kind of get overwhelmed with. But if you want to make some, some real change to be educated, to be, I think, clear in what your messaging is uh, as a player and be confident in that, in your delivery. And then you can go do what you do best on the pitch whilst also making meaningful change. Pat, the uh, Danish Football Association has been very much in the vanguard of the European criticism of uh, Qatar's human rights record. But uh, this week, the, uh, the head of the Danish FA uh, said that uh, things have improved significantly and enough for them to be happy about focusing on football. If things continue to improve, will the World Cup have been worth it in terms of leaving a genuine legacy? I think what a lot of people have felt that um, when you open a country up, you will shine a light. And that is the hope, that there is a light shone that can, it can lead to a little bit more um, equality. Just to answer Heather's question, I'd like to answer it and say I would have been very happy to wear a rainbow armband or laces or whatever um, to point to equality, not just, in, in fact, in that case, legality. But remember, it's a young country and there are, you know, that it was it was illegal to be gay in, in the UK within my lifetime. That I remember back that people Yeah, the 1966 that. World Cup took place in England when it was illegal to be gay. Exactly. So, so, you know, a country has to come on. And people do forget another thing. They, they talk about it as being a cultural thing. I believe it's, it's a religious belief as much as cultural, which people seem to sidestep at the moment. But I'm not party to anyone who wants to restrict equality of opportunity to anyone. And certainly in terms of the workers' rights, etc. Uh, that is what we need to shine the light on. And uh, the Qataris, when they've, they've went big for the World Cup, to, to, to expect that not to happen would be amazing. You know, considering you've got all the countries in the world and all the journalists all coming... You know, of course that was going to happen. So if they didn't expect that to happen and they're shocked by what's happened, I, I think they need to have a little look in the mirror. Um, and one other point to make, and I'm happy you brought it up there. Um, Hugo Lloris, his position is very interesting, isn't it? Um, because it's not um, the right on Western position that most of us accept. And many of us would sort of disagree with position. But you know what? That's what freedom of speech is. You're allowed to say it. You're allowed to have your own opinion. So for that, Hugo, that's fine. Well, as I said, things have changed. I've been speaking to a labor rights lawyer in Doha, Dr. Nizar Kosheri. He came to Qatar from India, in fact, Kerala, just like Ahmed, uh, in 1993 and represents migrant laborers in employment disputes. But he doesn't think that things have been as bad as human rights organizations have portrayed them to be here. No, I don't agree with you that because you know, see, there is exploitation of labor uh, here in Doha. I couldn't find any such issues. You know, see. What I can see is since from my living in Qatar since 1993, I can see that a big progress in uh, introduction of uh, various uh, policies for the welfare of uh, guest workers, the migrant workers, and uh, the expatriates living in this country. All are happy here. Now there is minimum wage commission, there is minimum wage, and there is wage protection system that is salary to be transferred. All these things are in place. To what extent has the World Cup accelerated those changes? No, this is not just because of uh, this uh, World Cup, uh, the labor policies are changed or labor reforms are in place. This is, uh, see, I, as I mentioned, you know, since 1993, I am an observer to this. I am here because people are contacting us with issues that are salary issues were there in the beginning, unpaid wages issues were in the be seriously in the beginning, then repatriation was a problem before. So all these things are addressed 
And now everything is uh, in place and all the laws, uh, the required laws in place and uh, access to justice is also uh, their online system to make complaints with the labor department and other places are also introduced. So as the country progress, along with that, the welfare of this uh, population is also uh, getting better. But the kafala system was only abolished uh, a few years ago as a result of the international attention following the World Cup. Can you really say the World Cup has had no impact? It is true that see the world uh, uh, world organizations, the trade unions, and all the highlighting these issues. What are the see that is what to to help people, help workers in reaching justice. That means access to justice is uh, is provided. Um, with the help of the international organizations, when there is an issue and it is highlighted, it is notified to the authorities, the system to be rectified, this is to be modified. So then such changes are in place. You've been suggesting that there hasn't really been a problem in Qatar. It's just part of a growing society, whereas so many human rights organizations, so many journalists have documented serious issues for the workers. But you're saying that this doesn't exist. There may be exceptional cases and exceptional issues you are, you are talking about. It is, not, uh, it is not a common issue here. You know. See, as I mentioned, I am here since 1993. I am an also, I'm also an expatriate worker. I am a migrant. So far, uh, I didn't find any problem with uh, uh, my relationship with any of the employers or company here. So what do you do? I mean, do you have any work if everyone is so happy and content? No, see, this is to get justice and to access to justice. We should assist people in you know, getting their rights uh, received. There are people coming to me saying that unpaid wages are there and they want to change the transfer of their employment. So there are certain issues to be addressed. And has this decreased in the last 12 years or is it still at the same level as it was uh, in 2010? It is decreased. It is decreased. All these issues are uh, getting addressed. And why do you think it's decreased? There is the role of international uh, uh, media, international uh, organizations. They highlight this issue. They take up this matter with the appropriate authorities and uh, things are getting changed. And that's all because of the World Cup, isn't it? One fact, we can say that, yes, one fact is that. That's Dr. Nizar Kosheri, who uh, is a lawyer and represents migrant workers in Qatar. Ahmed Hashim, our special guest, uh, just uh, a view from you. The, uh, the common response now from Qatar seems to be, whenever it's th they're criticized, oh, this is racism. Where, where do you stand on that? I, I wouldn't say they're, they're racist per se, but there also needs to be some introspection into the way media scrutinizes, for example, a World Cup host like Qatar, and will this continue, let's say, in 2026, which is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, an interesting question. Uh, would you look at every host of every major sporting event following from now? I'm not going to go into the past. I'm not going to go into what aboutism. But uh, is this a standard that we're going to set in place? If so, I think it's a good thing. Scrutiny is a good thing if it helps football become a vehicle for social change. Uh, the World Cup is here. It's a football tournament, uh, so let's talk about football. Um, the Qatar team, uh, they were the Asian champions. They are the Asian champions. In the last few years, they've travelled the world playing most of the top teams as they prepare for this World Cup. Do you think that this is, as well as being the biggest day in Qatar football history, do you think this is one of the biggest events in Qatar's history? Well, definitely. I think for, for Qatar and especially for, for the government, it's not just merely a sporting event. It's much more than that. It places Qatar on the map, and which seems to be one of the major objectives of, of hosting this event. And also being a sort of, of, of a leader for the Arab countries and, and in becoming the first uh, Middle Eastern nation and the first Arab nation to host the World Cup. In the footballing terms, uh, for sure, it's a big day for Qatar when they will play Ecuador on, on the 20th of November. But as a football fan from Qatar, who has followed the national team for so, quite some time, I would have loved for Qatar to reach the World Cup first as qualifiers instead of coming into this edition as, as hosts. And I think Qatar did have the quality to do that. And they came close in 1990 and 1998, uh, especially in 98 when they were just one game away from winning, uh, winning their playoff and reaching the World Cup, but they lost to Saudi Arabia. So there's been a lot of heartbreaks. And 
on Sunday when, when they play against Ecuador, I hope they can make up for all of that. Ahmad Hashim, local football journalist. Thank you very much, Denise, for joining us. Pleasure, pleasure to join you. I don't know if you were there, Pat, but um, in terms of the opening game, uh, four years ago, to the surprise of absolutely everyone in Russia, Russia won, well, Russia won, for one thing, but they won 5-0 against Saudi Arabia, which really got the whole country going and it got the team going and they nearly made it to the semi-final. You know, that, that's really the ideal scenario for any World Cup, isn't it? That the host starts with a, with, a, with a really good win and gets everyone going. That's the general thinking. You know, the host it has to be a great World Cup with the host being uh, very involved in it. I mean, you may well know a lot more than me about how passionate the Qatari fans are about the national team and what sort of effect they could have on the atmosphere of the place. I don't really know that. I look forward to seeing that. I think there will be enough people there to, you know, it will be full. I'm sure the stadiums will all be full for every game. So you're going to have that good positive feeling. The, the expectations of Qatar are limited anyway. So I, I don't think it's a great panic. What you do want is a good game or an interesting game. And I'll go tell you quickly about my two that I have been to. It wasn't the one in Russia. Um, one was uh, 2002 um, back in South Korea. I was in Seoul. Wow, what a game. Exactly. And <laughs> now that set up a tournament and a half. You know, France getting beat by uh, Senegal. And I will admit to it now, and please don't stop me from coming to the country now because of it. Um, I sneaked into that game when I was not supposed to be there. I actually managed with, you know, to get into the kind of the press area and then just kind of walked up. <laughs> Got into the game. I didn't have a ticket. I don't think that's going to happen now. I have to say things have moved on a little bit since then. Uh, the other one I went to actually was uh, Scotland versus Brazil in France, which was right you, yeah, it was the opening game in that one as well. And uh, Scotland made the big mistake of scoring against Brazil, which is never a great idea. It just gets them angry. Um, but it was slightly saddening that the Scotland fans are famous for being brilliant fans and loud and noisy and singing. The, the Brazil fans are not bad at that either. And you know the atmosphere wasn't very good. Because, as I'd said earlier, you, it was the VIPs, it was the people who are only there to be seen. And I just hope at this opening game there's a good load of fans who care about the game, and that'll make it special. Let's hear from another player who's uh, making his World Cup debut in Qatar, the USA winger Tim Weyer. The USA's first match is against Wales on Monday, and there will be one rather famous face in the crowd cheering on Tim, his father, who just happens to be the president of Liberia and former FIFA Player of the Year, George Weyer. Despite his many achievements in the game, George never played at a World Cup. Tim's been telling me what it means to him to have the chance to do something that his father never did. Yeah, it's a big moment. Um, my dad, who was uh, one of the greatest players, to African players to play, greatest players of all time, didn't, didn't have the opportunity, didn't get the chance to take his his country to world cup and i know that's a dream of his so you know me being here it's not only my dream it's his dream as well so i know he's living the moment through me and i uh, i'm gonna do my best to make sure that i i represent him in, in the best way possible is he taking a break that's from nice affairs question. of state in liberia to come and see you play yeah he's actually coming here on the 18th with my mom and my uncle so they're definitely going to be here so hopefully i i play well and, and make them proud <laughs> What, what has he been saying to you about uh, you being here at the World Cup? He's happy for me, and he just really wants me to, to you know, keep faith with me, pray every morning, pray every night, and make sure that I, I represent myself and, you know, our family name in, in the right way. Is it nice for you to, to do something that he didn't? Because I guess so far you're George Weah's son, but now you're at the World Cup, which is something he never did. You're, you've achieved something all, all on your own. I mean, if I'm being honest with you, I'm not, I don't want to be in competition at all. It was never a competition. I feel like, you know, with his career, his career benefits me in such a way that, you know, it sets the, ex the bar really high and the expectations are, are really high. So I'm just happy to be able to continue his legacy, legacy and hopefully one day I can have a son who can continue my legacy and we, you know, we keep that going. So, yeah. How's your fitness? Fitness is great. I'm <laughs> feeling 100%. Um, the weather out here is uh, amazing. It's, it's very hot. I love the heat, so I can't wait to can't wait to start flying. Tim Weyer, who up until recently was injured, so uh, it's good news for him that his fitness is 
back to uh, back to 100 percent. Heather, uh, one of the weak points in the USA uh, team is the attack. Do you think Tim Weyer is the kind of player who would plug some of the gaps there? Yeah, I think that Tim has a really great opportunity to be able to to be a difference maker. I think he will probably be coming off the bench, but uh, he could provide a spark and could provide some moments of brilliance. Obviously, he's been carrying a heavy load of being George's son all these years, right? So he he knows what it's like to uh, to deal with pressure, to deal with expectations, um, and and if he can provide the U.S. team some really bright moments. Yeah, I think that he could be uh, a hero for the, for the team and for the country. Is it a help or a hindrance to be George Ware's son, Pat? Um, well, I think the genes are probably quite helpful. <laughs> I'd say that for him for a kick-off. Um, yeah, but it's what he says. It's, it's really hard. See, when your, your parent or whatever is a world star, you can be a brilliant footballer or a very, very good footballer and play for some of the top teams, etc., but there's still a lot of people that look upon you and say, oh, yeah, you're not quite as good as your dad. So it's so unfair. Um, but I'm listening to him there. And I think Tim's kind of cool, isn't he? I think he's kind of yeah. at one with it. I think he understands it. And uh, he's had long enough to, to learn to live with it. And it, it really is down to the individual, whether it is a good or a bad thing. I think one of the good things for him, he's playing for a different country. That actually might help. And cool that he did that too, you know, cool that he wanted to make his own path and create his own legacy. So I give him a lot of credit for that decision. Okay, it's time for the customary predictions. Uh, So who's going to win it then? Who are we going to talk about, you know, at Christmas time um, as the new world champions, Heather? Argentina. Um, They have a good blend of some OGs. Led by the best ever, Lionel Messi. He's already said it's his last World Cup, so we'll see. We'll see. Obviously, the U.S. is going to want to see him in that World Cup in 2026. But it's, yeah, it's, it's just their time to send him off. To send him off with, you know, an in, international glory that he deserves. And they have enough uh, talent in the group to, to get it done. And, um, yeah, they're, they're healthy. They're firing on all cylinders. And... Uh, from all accounts, is a very loose and, and confident group of guys. And so it's Argentina's time. 36 games unbeaten. Pat? Um, yeah, that's a, a very good shout. Uh, I think if you're going to win World Cups generally these days, you need to have an incredibly good attack. I'm looking at the Brazilian attack and think they look as if they could be very special. But I'm going to surprise you. Even though the form's been average, even though they've lost a number of players, particularly in midfield, I'm going France. Um, Are you? Yeah. What? Yeah, Pat. Mbappe, yeah, Mbappe, Benzema, Griezmann—you you know all these players that are capable of scoring goals. Wow, Pat, I didn't see that coming from you. To be honest, I love it though. No. I love it because everybody's writing them off, and Pat Nevin says they're winning the whole thing. Yep. So the sages have spoken. It's either going to be France or Argentina who wins the World Cup. It starts on Sunday, and our first. Extra World Football in Qatar pod will drop just after the opening game between Qatar and Ecuador. Don't forget that. Just subscribe. It's just much easier. Join us for that. Enjoy the opening game if you're watching it. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. 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 World Football in Qatar is a BBC Sport production for the BBC World Service.